I do this at uh, every Hasgeek event that I go to, <coughs> which is that I change my topic at the last moment. <laughs> I've decided that, uh, that JavaScript isn't really that good and I want to talk about something that's a little closer to my heart. Uh, it's about the movie Andaz Apna Apna and how it's a sign for uh, true change in the world. Uh, about things that we can learn from the characters from Amir Khan and Salman Khan. Of course, I'm kidding. Uh, you don't have to take me seriously at all. Um, my name is Sunil Pai. It's actually PAI, but my math professor in uh, Surutkal called me uh, PAI and it's stuck since then. Uh, so far, my dad calls me Pai as well now. It's slightly odd. Um, I was born in 83 in Sonia Clinic in Manipal, so that's my that's my heritage. And uh, I went to Madhu Krupa and uh, then I went to MJC. After that I did Suratkal and from there I've done a whole bunch of places. Uh, I worked in the government. I have, my first job was actually writing uh, embedded software for trains in Chitrandan. That was great. That was, uh, that was pretty neat. Uh, since then I've worked in uh, design firms. Uh, I've worked uh, a little bit with Facebook. Uh, they're a pretty neat engineering team in uh, Palo Alto at the time when their office was there. Uh, I've uh, stood for about two and a half hours outside Cupertino waiting for Steve Jobs to pass on his blue Mercedes. That was a little creepy. Uh, but uh, I now work at Yahoo. I work as a tech lead on uh, Yahoo Maps. And uh, there's a lot of serious JavaScript work there. In fact, until recently, Douglas Crawford used to uh, work there. Uh, Douglas Crawford is considered the grandfather of JavaScript for a couple of reasons, which we'll get to. Uh, but no, but in Yahoo, you, you you get the feel for why JavaScript is that important. Yahoo is actually moving its entire software stack to JavaScript now slowly. Uh, even their backend components, they have this framework called Mito. Uh, before I start, actually, before I go down this road, how many people here are comfortable with JavaScript? They've written scripts. Okay, how many of you have written a full size application in JavaScript? Your apps. Okay, okay, okay close enough. So. Uh, so let me guess, you guys started off by googling a jQuery plugin for a slideshow, yeah? Okay, I see about three hands there, not bad. Uh, that's how all of us learn. JavaScript isn't really taught in any college. Uh, somebody tells you, make me a web page with a drop down menu and you just google that thing. Go ahead, you search on Yahoo. Um, hey, uh, so uh, let me get on to it. The year is 1991. Uh, the British magazine The Sun publishes an article about Tim Berners-Lee, about a computer scientist who's made this crazy invention called the web. And uh, he says that it's going to change billions of lives and everybody's laughing at him. He's like, are you serious? Everybody's tried this before. Uh, this is actually an offshoot of uh, an American military project called ARPANET, but this fellow saying we need to get it to consumers and so on and so forth. Uh, so this is in 1991. Give you a little time scale in 1992, I did my Janiwar thing and my uh, uncle gave me a 386 as my first computer, which I started programming. So somewhere around the same thing. They even had a, a pseudonym for their uh, for their journalist. If you can read it, it was called dot com. It was considered funny at the time, I suppose. So the 90s were all about the browser wars. If you guys were born sometime in the early 80s, you probably remember the whole uh, PC Quest chip digit era where every new magazine you would get the new version of Netscape or of uh, Inter when Internet Explorer 5 or 6 came out and you were like, this is great, this is so awesome. And then you had to do the, you had to dial in, you had to you had to dial up for, to get onto the internet. Uh, at the time in Manipal, I think, uh, I forget, there, there, was a, there was one dial-up service that my mom used to scream at me for running up my phone bills. Anyway, so the browser bots were going on. Uh, and uh, there's a quote from Jamie Zerbinski who was working with Netscape at the time. Uh, he said, we were shipping a finished product in six months or we were going to die trying. There, was no, there were no second chances, there was no time to make a better, better product about it. Uh, Microsoft was trying very hard to gain control on the web, as was Netscape. They were trying to Netscape was trying to bring a standards-based approach, which eventually became Mozilla and so on. A whole bunch of great programmers from the time. Jamie, Jamie Zawinski was here. Brendan Eich was there. I'll talk about him as well. Um, they were all trying. They were trying everything they could to make sense of something called the internet. Um, at the time, Netscape uh, in uh, '94 or so. Uh, they had a collaboration with Sun Microsystems where they decided they figured out a way to get Java into uh, 
into the browser Java applets, if you remember that phase as well. Um, so at that point of time, there was a lucky little engineer called Brendan Ike, and somebody gave him the job saying, in two weeks, we want a tiny scripting language also, so that people can like write scripts into their web page and do stuff. Uh, for what it's worth, Brendan Ike was actually a functional programming guy. Uh, he was hugely into these languages called Self and Scheme. Uh, scheme is, everybody knows what Lisp is here, functional programming, uh, okay, one person. Uh, check it out, uh, you should uh, check it out, Scheme is now called Racket. Uh, but the reason I bring it up is because uh, Brendan Ike was sitting and he was doing an academic pursuit of the language, but he was given this job of saying, you know, you have about two weeks, give or take, uh, the exact number has been lost, but uh, around this time he was given about two weeks and said, uh, come up with the language. So he took the best uh, features of, uh, of Scheme and essentially functional programming and his boss told him it has to vaguely look like Java. So he brought a C-like syntax into it, which is why we have var x is equal to 1, 2, 3 and so on and so forth. And as a marketing ploy, they called it JavaScript. That name JavaScript ruined its reputation for a good 10 years until the early 2000s. Um, uh, something I learned uh, while I was uh, researching for this thing, Oracle Incorporated actually holds the trademark with JavaScript and uh, Netscape actually has it on license. And that license passes on to Mozilla, which is why Mozilla is allowed to use the word JavaScript on their pages. Uh, that being said, Oracle has no chance in hell of actually defending this, for example, if Microsoft uses it. In any case, at the point of time, this fellow came out with JavaScript. Microsoft saw it and they are like, oh, we totally forgot about having a scripting language on our browsers. Uh, they came up with two variants. One was VBScript, died really quickly, and JScript, which was vaguely compatible with JavaScript. For all purposes assured, let's say that it was compatible with JavaScript. But they called it JScript at the time. Uh, and then began the age of this statement on every single web page you saw. How many people remember this? Yep. Uh, I remember the first uh, net cafe in Manipal was this thing called Cyberlog, and it was very close to Tiger Circle. They used to charge 90 or 95 rupees an hour, and I spent that money. I spent it. Uh, I mean, my dad thought it was for education, but I don't have surfing board, let's be honest. Uh, anyway, but this I remember everywhere, every single web page works best on Internet Explorer 5.5 and above. And for what reason? A whole bunch of reasons. Uh, one is Microsoft was actually pushing uh, their own proprietary uh, plugin structure called ActiveX. Has anyone here done, an, done any ActiveX programming? One hand in the back. Okay, oh, two, one more. Uh, they were trying to push ActiveX really hard. And uh, so there were a whole bunch of internal applications inside companies and so on that were trying really hard to use this. And, uh, but Netscape, etc., were obviously pushing JavaScript. So uh, what are the reasons why JavaScript won? Well, a few things came up. Antitrust investigations against Microsoft started in 1998. Uh, if you were around during that time, it was covered in all the magazines, all the newspapers. It was on the BBC and CNN and Doordarshan. And it was huge because they were like, here is a company that tries to beat out its competitors by unfair tactics. Um, but, okay, fine. Uh, when they're talking unfair tactics, they were talking about bundling the browser with the, they basically made it free and bundled it with the OS. Uh, and at the time, since net rates weren't that high and weren't really educated enough to find out about other browsers, they ended up getting market dominance, both in OS and for the internet. Um, but thankfully, Microsoft contributed one great thing to the internet, the XML HTTP request object. First launched on IE5.0 in 1999. Uh, it was very sparingly used. Everybody, they were still pushing ActiveX. It wasn't, and at the point of time, JavaScript was still considered, exact words, toy language. Very sad, very sad times, per se. But in any case, they still kept going on, and uh, in 2001, as part of uh, Google's usual April Fool's joke, they launched Gmail, where they said we are giving you uh, one GB, was it at the time? They said we are giving you one GB of email space. And this was huge because I think the biggest at the time was Hotmail, which was something like 20 or 50 MB. Uh, and everybody thought it was an April Fool's joke, but no, you, uh, everybody started sharing the invites around. It wasn't that anybody could sign up. But they started, the reason I bring up Gmail is because 
Then a year or two after that, they started spiffing up their interface and they leaned heavily on H XML HTTP request. From what I remember, Gmail was the first full-fledged Ajax application. Uh, Isn't that 2004? Uh, Gmail? Gmail was 2004. Uh, I think it was 2004. Okay, oh, yeah, I got the date. Okay, 2004. 2001 was the IPO. No, yeah, I think it's around 2004. Right? Uh, sorry, I was in Anapa. I got this wrong. Uh, 2004, they lost that. Anyway, so quietly in another corner, uh, Douglas Crawford was working as CTO for this company called State Software. And he hated XML and he was getting into functional programming and the web. And he invented JSON, JavaScript object notation. Everybody here knows what JSON is. Just to be clear, everybody here is, is an engineer, right? Like, okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, so he invented JSON. Uh, this was formally proposed as a as a standard in 2005 or 2006. I'm not sure, but 2001, 2002 is when he actually invented it and it started getting popular. Then in 2005, something happened that broke open the gates for Web 2.0. An article called a new approach to web applications was published by Jesse James Garrett on a site called List of Art. List of Art was a conglomerate of great writers, technology, this thing who were essentially trying to push the edge of technology and see what they could do with it. And he coined the term Ajax, asynchronous JavaScript and XML. How odd, but you think that you barely use XML anymore, but the word is stuck. That's fine, that's cool. So the world collectively lost its shit. They're like, oh my god, and then they realized, yes, Gmail has been doing this for a while, for a year, I guess, at the time. And, um, and it was neat because everybody then started figuring out tricks to do with it. That was the point that I believe JavaScript started maturing from a toy language status to be able to do real work. Because right after that, we started seeing the birth of frameworks. Uh, this is about the same time that I actually joined the web development world. Uh, I actually started cut my teeth on prototype JS. Uh, the deal with these frameworks in specific was the people who came up with them were coming from a background of Ruby and Java and so on and so forth. And they were bringing those object oriented ideas into the browser. You can create classes and hierarchies and so on and so forth. And they were like, even though JavaScript doesn't support object oriented programming and inheritance and so on and so forth natively, because it, because of the decisions that Brendan and I took when he actually made it, it was powerful enough to emulate it and people could build real stuff in patterns that they were already comfortable with. But that being said, there was something else that happened at the time. jQuery happened. John Riesig put up a little article in August 2005, it was called Selectors in JavaScript, where he was talking about how to use CSS style selectors to quickly grab elements of a page and do stuff with it. Uh, this is the world of jQuery, this little blog post. Uh, it's brilliant reading to see that how prescient he is about how the future is going to be for JavaScript. And while everybody else, for example, Prototype and Scriptaculous and EXTJS and uh, Dojo, they were all about going about this huge object hierarchy way, uh, John Riesig stuck to this entire functional approach of creating chain methods and saying, you know, grab these elements, do so and so with it. Uh, jQuery till this date doesn't really expose anything for creating program structure. Uh, but it does give a tiny plugin interface, but this this style of programming also has influenced the next well seven years of JavaScript, which we'll see. In 2006, Joe Hewitt, one of the guys who used to work with Brandon Ike in creating the World Wide Web and JavaScript, uh, he got really sick of using alert alerts to see what the values of the objects were. And Firefox, oh no, uh, sorry, Joey Hewitt was part of the Firefox uh, effort, sorry. Uh, so Firefox had a little plug, uh, extension architecture at the point, they had just come out with it for about a year or so, and he decided to create <coughs> Firebug, where he's like, you know what, web developers de deserve a mature debugging environment. Uh, I remember uh, messing with it, starting with 0 0.1, 0 0.3, and then it hit uh, 1.0, I think in early 2007, not certain, but uh, this was it. This was when console.log became the favorite method of logging objects into your browser. Again, everybody here does a console.log in JavaScript, no? Console.log, go learn Firebug. Uh, this is now obviously internally part of Chrome DevTools uh, and Safari and Opera and even IE now accepts uh, this uh, this format, console.log, you can log objects. There's a whole API, of course, it's not just console.log. But this is one of the turning points for mature development in JavaScript on the web. 
2008, Douglas Crawford publishes a book, JavaScript: The Good Parts. There's a humorous image somewhere where, if you compare the sizes of the the definitive si uh, guide to JavaScript, and the good parts are about a fifth of that. The idea is that JavaScript, because Ben and I created it in such a rush, it has a whole lot of rough edges. So, ja so Douglas Crawford is like, you know, you can take out a whole bunch of that, concentrate on this beautiful shiny code, and those are the good parts. Use that, be safe. Um, and again, this is setting the standard. This book and <coughs> Douglas Crawford's many lectures are now setting the standard for how uh, JavaScript should be written. He also started encouraging that people start reading code more. Um, JavaScript started entering the open source world in, slightly, in a slightly bigger way at that time. Uh, at the same point of time, um, we were still vaguely battling with Internet Explorer. I think IE uh, 7 or 8 had just about come out at the time. And uh, I7, I think, actually. And uh, Mozilla was finally getting a foothold on saying that the standards based approach to creating web pages is the way to go. Uh, which is all very well and good. We were all on Firefox uh, 2 at the time. Uh, that was pretty cool. Uh, in September 2008, though, something else happened. Google Chrome launched, and the era of speed began. Uh, the first time I launched Google Chrome, I remember it was on a project that we were working on for a client and we were having huge performance issues. We, for the first time we opened it in Google Chrome and it was smooth as silk. And everybody, and uh, Google Chrome even came out with a little comic book at the time. Google came out with a comic book written by Scott McCloud, one of my favorite graphic novelists, uh, explaining why it's a better browser. Uh, they also brought about this entire deal about having the interface being as minimal as possible. They don't want any toolbars or uh, extra bookmark buttons and all that. Try to keep it as clean as possible. Hence the word Chrome, which is to say uh, minimal Chrome and the web content and your page should shine through. Uh, in 2009, a student by the name Ryan Gall was talking to Tim Becker and he came up with Node, Node.js. Uh, fans of Node.js here? Okay. Oh, sweet. Close enough. Uh, this obviously became a little more popular in a year or two. I have links to these presentation, this presentations where he actually talks about the entire history of Node. Uh, have a look at it. But uh, Ryan Dahl basically cracked, for a number of years, people have been trying to bring JavaScript into environments other than the browser. But Ryan Dahl cracked it because he made this tiny uh, uh, framework called LibUE or something. And he put a JavaScript layer, layer on top of it. And he brought asynchronous input output. We'll talk about it, but I want to rush to load the slides. Um, in any case, this is my version of what I believe are the major events that have affected JavaScript to be the way they are today. Feel free to interrupt me, ask any questions at any point of time. I like it. I will have a conversation with you. No worries. Um, <coughs> but I've, at its heart, I believe JavaScript has been getting to this place because it was a toy language. Uh, people might say the word toy derisively, but I think it more it makes more sense when you say that it's a hacker's language. If you want to run something, if you want to create a quick implementation of an algorithm, instead of having to start up your Java VM or having to compile any code, just fire up a browser and you're good to go. And with stuff like Firebug and the Dev Console, it's a question of right clicks and inspect element. You have your console, you're good to go. You can write whatever code you want, change anything you want. And a huge community started building around this, and they started saying. Well, JavaScript seems pretty cool. Where all can we use it? Instead of going down the history of that, let me pick out what I think are the big hits. I uh, say JavaScript, all the things. And frankly, it is. The first is Rhino, Jaxer, and Helma. Rhino is obviously JVM. Uh, Jaxer was this uh, effort done by this company called Aptana. People have used the Aptana IDE. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, so uh, Aptana, Jaxer was their version of server side JavaScript where you could write script tags in the HTML and say run that server. It was a little clunky, but it was an effort. Elma was something that was running on the Jetty server. Node wiped away all of those. Uh, some people still use Rhino for a number of reasons, and uh, very valid reasons. But Node is essentially considered the de facto non-browser JavaScript implementation. Node, of course, runs on V8, which is what Google Chrome was built on, and so on and so forth. A um, couple of other interesting places where JavaScript is used, in Adobe Creative Suite, this is one of my favorite usages. You can write little scripts to do whatever you want. You can do batch conversions, 
create red refractive images, generate JPGs, save them off, and so on and so forth. Anything, uh, a very common example is taking an Illustrator file with multiple layers and creating a PDF. You can write a little script to do that and you're good to go. So JavaScript runs in Creative Suite. Uh, they, uh, I, I don't know exactly what uh, interpreter they're using, but yeah, Unity 3D. Uh, you guys are iOS programmers, some of you. Uh, you obviously know what Unity 3D is. It's a little framework for building games and so on on, uh, on the iOS platform or on the web platform or Android. Um, so Unity 3D also has JavaScript uh, scripting uh, in it. Uh, you can expose objects to it. Uh, I think they also have a version of Lua that you can use to do it, but there you go. Uh, WebOS and Firefox OS are, well WebOS is very close to my heart, WebOS is what Palm was betting its future on just before it, you know, died. Uh, but uh, their entire OS was essentially built on top of V8 and the WebKit engine. And you could write apps for the phone natively in JavaScript and HTML and CSS. Uh, that was pretty cool. Uh, lessons from that have been learned and now Firefox or the Mozilla Foundation is trying to make something called the Firefox OS. Uh, have a look, please Google this, this is fascinating work. Uh, they're basically saying, you know what, Android and iOS have their place as this Firefox OS. So this is where we want to concentrate our energy now. They're building another entire mobile OS from the ground up on uh, the IM Monkey JavaScript engine and so on. Uh, then there are these things where you use JavaScript to build mobile apps. Uh, Accelerator uses JavaScript as a scripting engine and XML slash HTML like layouting. It's pretty cool. Um, some people like it, some people don't. PhoneGap is uh, obviously now it's Adobe. It's an Adobe project. Uh, same thing, you build projects in HTML, CSS, JavaScript, wrap it up in the wrapper and deploy it to the App Store or the Google Play or so on and so forth. Uh, or anything, any any OS that supports a web view. The idea is that the security model, well, not just the security model, but the entire structure of the web, where they say, okay, you can't do cross domain requests and so on, or you can run scripts within this domain, and you have access to a DOM, a document object model, and so on and so forth. Those are pretty good for writing applications, and as far as you make it look like, as far as you make it look like a native application on your phone, you're good to go. Awesome, that works. Um, and this is the current range of hardware hackers. Uh, Arduino is a little board that you can buy for about $100, $120. Yeah, or is it cheaper now? I don't, I don't, uh, around that much. And uh, you can figure out a way to get uh, either V8 or Node running on it. Which is to say that you can use JavaScript to control hardware. Uh, one of my uh, friends, Rakesh Bhai, not related, uh, from Bobby, he'll be coming down for the JSCO talk, which I'll talk about in a bit. Uh, he's building a robot with the Raspberry Pi, which is essentially a little board, a little x86 board, and he's promising to put lasers on it. And his API for it is basically to say robot dot left and a callback after it's done, robot dot right. He has his entire JavaScript API for controlling the robot across places that you can program or control with a remote control. It's pretty cool. Beagle mode is also another <coughs> JavaScript friendly hardware mode. So that's hardware and mobile and gaming and applications and servers and uh, I could go on with the list, oh, this is not exactly clear, but I swear, this is from the JavaScript article on Wikipedia, have a look at it. This is just a section of all the things where they're being used as a scripting engine or as an application platform or as embedded engines and so on and so forth. JavaScript is everywhere. The idea is that since it is available on the web and everybody loves HTTP and there are open standards, culturally this has made JavaScript become the lingua franca for the web, the common language for the man on the web. Uh, so yeah, like I said, and browsers. Um, it's a lot easier now, now that we have jQuery and all in the mix, but if you're around, around 2005, 2006, you would have known what a headache it was writing JavaScript for browsers. Because there's JavaScript the language, which has headaches in itself, but every browser gave a slightly different environment for it to exist in. For example, if you had to attach events to an object in, in IE, you would have to use attach event, whereas in, uh, in Gecko and other standard based browsers, you would use add event listener. Uh, one browser supported event bubbling, the other supported uh, uh, event propagation. It was a complete mess. 
<coughs> this has gotten better. Thankfully, now major browser vendors like Apple, Microsoft, Mozilla, Opera, they all come under this. Uh, they all participate in uh, the W3C, that's the World Wide Web Consortium. Uh, they participate in ECMA. ECMA originally started as something called, and I kid you not, the European Computer Manufacturers Association. They have since said that we are ditching that, it's just one word, it's ECMA. Uh, so they all get together. So now we know that the new features which are getting pumped into browsers are usually agreed on by everybody before they put on. It becomes a standard for five years in the future, but this is the reason why you have cool CSS3 transitions where everybody is agreeing to a vaguely similar spec and you can have prefixed and so on and so forth. So yeah, uh, essentially the rules are now made by ECMA. Uh, it's very easy uh, to see what's going on in ECMA. They are a completely open committee. Uh, I mean, uh, you can just Google ECMA, find out what their mailing list is and sign on to it. You'll get flooded by emails, but they're awesome because the who's who of the internet are participating in this. You will find <coughs> Douglas Crockford complaining that we are putting too much into the language. You will find uh, uh, YCAT saying that uh, this is not Ruby like enough. There will be people who say, why don't you bring this in from this language? There is a lot of arguing, but it's great to see because it's a living standard. It's something that you can be a part of. It's something that you can actually contribute to. Uh, CommonJS is uh, another spec, another standard that's coming about specifically for making sure that you can use JavaScript in a standardized format across across environments. So they're trying to figure out a new module system. JavaScript has lacked a module system for a while. Uh, they're trying to figure out a way to import and export modules, of course. Uh, they're trying to figure out a way to add features onto JavaScript, for example, scoped variables and so on. <coughs> hey. Uh, okay. uh, so I'll quickly step through this. Uh, some of the features of JavaScript, some of the things that actually make it so cool. Um, one is that it is very C-like in the, in, when I'm talking about syntax, for example, you do a for loop and it looks exactly like a for loop in C. Uh, of course, um, you'll have semicolons which end statements. Uh, you will have uh, two while loops and so on. So that actually makes it easy because a whole lot of people, uh, I know for me at least, their first language was C. Uh, that's the language that they teach you in colleges. And that's the language that they teach you when you go to uh, an NIIT or so, something like that. So it's a very easy language to jump to as opposed to something like Lisp, which requires some academic forethought before you even start doing something productive in it. Uh, that means that stuff like dynamic objects and loose typing, where there aren't really any data types in, uh, well, uh, variables don't have to be stuck to a particular data type in JavaScript. Unlike C or Objective C, where the moment you declare a variable to be a type long int, it has to stay that way, and you try to assign anything else to it, it will try to typecast it, or it will move on to a, uh, through an exception, or so on. Depends on the language. Uh, but here it's easy, you can say x is equal to 1, 2, 3, the next segments you can say x is equal to uh, uh, the quick fox terms over a lazy dog or it can become a boolean and it's nice. <coughs> and these objects are runtime modifiable, not just at, you know, at compilation time where you can create your structures. You can actually create your structures and classes at runtime. It becomes incredibly powerful after a while. In fact, you can <coughs> change the entire structure of programs based on well, what you needed to do at the time. Uh, it's functional. Um, this is actually a recent trip of mine. In searching for the, while I was doing my software archaeology on JavaScript, I started looking into functional programming and trying to learn about it. I started reading structure and interpretation of computer programs. And it's interesting, uh, you learn a whole bunch of things. Ideas like uh, how to create map, what map reduce actually means when you're actually writing code by yourself. Uh, how data flows through components and how you can be make sure that it's safe and all that. Uh, anyway, so functional programming gives a lot. And like I said, because of Brendan, I single person's affinity to functional programming, we can thank him that JavaScript is at the stage that it is today. In those two weeks of all nighters that he pulled, uh, whatever ideas he could has allowed JavaScript to be so powerful to be able to do a whole bunch of things today. Fair enough, he got a whole bunch of things wrong. Everybody can just, just uh, makes fun of him for that. And it's, uh, and it's interesting because he takes it on. He actually has the first web page that he ever made. Uh, I should have taken a screenshot of this, but 
the first web page that he made with JavaScript was a little clock timer. <coughs> we were showing the time clicking over, saying 1231, 1232, 1233. And the page is the worst GeoCities ripoff you've seen in your life. GeoCities, tripod web pages, nobody had one in the 90s? I did. Okay. Worry to see the has been point. Uh, but yeah, so functional programming. So stuff like closures and all come from functional programming. Uh, his decision to make variables have functional scope and not just block scope. You know this, right? Like you can declare a, a variable inside a inside a for loop, for example, and you can access it outside that. That's because in JavaScript you don't have block scope like C. You have functional scope. The variable exists throughout the scope of the function. Uh, then there's this idea of prototypes, which is a whole topic in itself. But the idea is that every function, since functions are first class objects, <laughs> it's a strange idea to get your idea around if, if you to get your head around if you're not into it. But uh, okay, let me just quickly go. So yeah, they have a prototype for emulating object-oriented programming and so on and so forth. And also very added. Unlike Java and all where if you declare a function to be able to accept two variables, two arguments and you can't accept any more or any less in JavaScript, you can do whatever you want. It doesn't matter. You have access to all the arguments inside a function. Uh, they have a very neat array object syntax, the curly brackets and the square brackets, and it has support for regular expressions. This is enough. You can build anything you want with this as long as you pump it into an environment that gives you access to everything else. Node gives you access to processes. Uh, browsers give you access to the DOM, and so on and so forth. This is my last, last slide, I promise. I'm going to quickly finish this off. So, a couple of things that strike me as strange about JavaScript or that actually make it popular, I decided to just put it on one slide. One is that it's not really taught anywhere. JavaScript isn't taught in any college, it isn't taught as part of a functional programming course or an object oriented course. Especially, I can't think of a single place in India that does so. All of us have started without fail by Googling how do I make a drop down menu. Uh, for now, you might find Stack Overflow answers. Earlier, it used, earlier it used to be Expert Exchange. Expert Exchange. Uh, and uh, you would find uh, the W3 schools. W3 schools, I learned a whole lot from that. Uh, and HTML dog. So it's not really taught anywhere. The only way you can learn this is by, is by reading as much as you can. The problem with that in the 2000s at least was that you would learn a whole lot of wrong things. But thankfully now, because of GitHub and Twitter and blogs and ASCII, you know what bits to avoid and what bits to do well. So that's pretty cool. That being said, JavaScript, it's very easy to shoot yourself in the foot. You can, I'm telling you, the deal with becoming good at JavaScript isn't learning what to do, it's to learn what not to do. You can very well create a big giant Java hierarchy of uh, objects and, uh, and a tree and so on and so forth, but in the end, it's just going to shoot you in the foot. There's no tail on optimization if any functional programming junkies are here. Uh, uh, JavaScript now is being used as a target compilation language. People are creating new languages, new programming languages that compile to JavaScript. Uh, some interesting uh, examples are CoffeeScript. This is by uh, Jeremy Ashkenaz. It's nice. It's a very Python, Ruby-like syntax for JavaScript. I recommend it. Uh, Closure Script, if you guys want to get a little deeper into functional programming, uh, Closure is by uh, Rich Hickey as is Closure script. Uh, this also compiles down to JavaScript, so you can run it in your browser. GWT is Google Web Toolkit. You could write your code in Java and it would convert it to JavaScript. I've never done it, I'm not planning on it, but it's there. And JavaScript has finally brought the word asynchronous to the mainstream. If you have anything that's long running, unlike Ruby or so on, where you say, I'm going to do a MySQL statement and the next line I'm going to access the results of that, you're going to make all input output or anything that takes programming as asynchronous. Uh, it's pretty cool. And then you pass a function call back into it and you get the data into it. More. And write ones cuss everywhere. I've never ever seen a JavaScript program that I didn't find something wrong with. I've like from my favorite programmers all the way down to the worst, including myself. And I have look at the code that I myself wrote two weeks ago and say, what an idiot you are. What a blithering idiot you are for writing code like this rewrite. And it's just that kind of language, but it is powerful, supported in a whole bunch of environments, and I highly recommend that you, uh, well, that you jump into it. There's, there's a ton of material out there, and I'm open to questions now. Anything, JavaScript related, Manipal related, my first girlfriend in MDC. <laughs> dot. Sorry? Google's dot. Google's dot? Oh, dot. Dart as a language, yeah, that's another. Uh, 
Google is trying to make a new language um, called Dart, and uh, see, I have, I have major problems with Dart. Uh, they are trying to give an enterprise class language for people to work on. Google obviously bets on the web. Google wants you to use the web for building applications. They want you to use Chrome. They want you to use Chrome OS. They want to use Chrome apps, and which is fine. They're they're pushing all this back to the community. Nothing against them for that. But there are people somewhere in the depths of Google who have come up with this language called Dart, which looks, which gives a whole bunch of Java-like features to this language, which compiles down to JavaScript. For example, interfaces and uh, proxy objects, and so on and so forth. Um, jury is still out on that. I wouldn't pass any judgment on it yet. But the standard thing is that if you try to make a single hello world. Uh, example in Dart, it compiles down to something like uh, 300k of code. So you know uh, something's wrong with them there. And there are other people who are heavily pushing plain vanilla JavaScript, like Paul Irish for Google. So right now, until I until I get that this thing clear on what they want Dart to be, I wouldn't recommend to jumping into it too much. Interesting language. Don't get me wrong, but yeah, it'll take a while. It'll take a while. Do you want to hear about the drunk emails of sent Steve, Steve Jobs? It's true. Really? No questions? Okay, awesome. Uh, that means I was excellent and you guys are not confused at all. No? Uh, I'd like to take a moment here to talk about JS Foo. JS Foo is happening in uh, Bangalore on October 22nd. Of course. 19th and 20th. Oh, 22nd is this one, card no, Sorry. Uh, 19th and 20th of October. Uh, it's going to be great. For some reason, these guys have put me in charge of the program committee, which is the easiest job in the world because we have the best submissions coming in. Uh, we have Brian Leroux from Adobe PhoneGap, the inventor of PhoneGap, actually coming down, giving a talk. Uh, uh, we, we, have, we have Rakesh talking about robots. We'll have people talking about Photoshop scripting, JavaScript everywhere. The theme is JavaScript everywhere. It's really important because at this point of time, I think front-end programmers or interface developers are the most valuable developers in this country. You can find a job if you just walk out onto the street. And we feel like events like JS Foo is where we want to up the level of JavaScript developers in this country. Uh, we are concentrating only on the world's best stuff. And we are already at a place where we could pull off this conference tomorrow and it would be great. Uh, I'll be trying to speak there too, assuming that if I put a proposal and it gets voted up, uh, but it'll be awesome. Uh, Hasgeek has already done this event uh, three times: once in Chennai, once in Pune, and once in Bangalore last year again. Uh, this year it promises to be way bigger, and you are all invited. <coughs> cool. Oh yes. Wait, how do you see? Um, Facebook recently had a major issue with their app, their iOS app, which was essentially a web view wrapped in a, in a container for iOS. The entire problem with JavaScript and web containers for making apps is that you're never going to get the kind of performance that you get from uh, native code that's running closer to the middle. That being said, a, a huge a huge percentage of applications that are actually being made for the iOS store, let's keep games to the side, are relatively simple to actually make uh, and look very performant and very clean on, uh, on your phone. My absolute favorite example is Instagram. Not a lot of people get this, but most of the parts of Instagram are written in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. If, if Instagram can do it, I don't see why anybody else can. The trick isn't to figure out how to make it as flashy as possible. The trick as with any art or with any technology is to figure out what pieces you can use and what pieces you don't have to use to get the best possible user experience for a user. If you can get to that and at that point of time, for example, if you are making a game, then you know that JavaScript on the mo on a mobile phone is probably the wrong choice right now. But if it's something that shows you a list of photos, or uh, um, I don't know, that uh, location based like Foursquare or something, uh, go for it, right? JavaScript. If it cuts, 
Because the amount of time it takes you to get to market, you should absolutely do it if you're already comfortable with it. That being said, I've, been, I've seen expert iOS programmers bang out an app in like a weekend, and they're being world class. So, yeah, that's that's my opinion on it. Now, you shouldn't just walk into it saying that okay, we are going to since I've heard that HTML5 is the best thing and it's going to be super fast. Three engineers, you guys don't know anything about it, learn about it, and then a week I want an app. See, that's never going to work. It's a question of what resources you have at hand and whether you understand the medium well enough to know what it can and what it cannot do. I'll count to three for the last question. Three, two, one. Thank you. Thanks, Ray.